Uh, the genesis of uh, Mallrats kind of came about at Sundance 94, if I'm correct. That was where um, we had done Clerks. Clerks had debuted more or less, and more Clerks got picked up by Miramax. And at the closing party of the festival, we met um, Jim Jacks. I spent a lot, a lot of time talking to Jim Jacks. We talked about that when they were ready to start talking about their next movie, that we would talk. And I didn't hear from them for almost two months. And I actually thought, well, I, you know, I guess you know, it didn't work out, or they changed their minds, or whatever. Then one day I got a call saying they were coming to town and they'd like to meet. And they walked in the meeting. We talked for five minutes. They said, "Okay, we want to do our next movie with you." I said, "Well, I was, we were thinking about doing this flick, Mall Rats." And he's like, "What is it?" And I'm like, "Well, it's it's kind of like Clerks in a Mall. It's clerks very do." And um, he was just like, "That's great." So at that point, we just it was after that it was just starting to settle down and figure out what we were going to do which they already kind of knew that. And then, and then we just started working on the script. And the buzzword about the film, or the buzz description was it was going to be a smart porkies. Yep. You know, that we want to make a smart porkies, and this is a smart porkies. And so we bought it, we're like, whatever, you know, you call it what you will, it's going to be what it is. We used to call it a smart porkies. <laughs> I mean, nobody's done kind of an R-rated youth comedy in a while. I mean, it used to be one of the staples of the business. The logic was um, exhibitors want to see um, young naked tits. They don't see that enough these days. Back in the days of Porky's, man, you couldn't... The heyday. The heyday of, of young tits on, on screen cinema. Um, La cinema de tit. There, there were, you know, throw a rock and you hit a teen titty film, and you didn't do that anymore. It didn't really happen. So they were kind of interested in, in hitting that. You know, they thought there was an absence in the market a hole that we could fill with mall rats. And I mean, there was still, like, even though you're getting a rated R and you're showing a topless woman and, and doing all that stuff, there's still that thing of, like, let's not put too many fucks in it. Let's not put too much obscene or, or, or filthy language. Mm. There's still that concern, although we were going for a hard R, which to us meant, like, we might as well just, you know curse up a storm, like get real blue and, you know, speak like sailors, but, you know, that was one thing that even Curse like longshoremen, <laughs> I believe, in the parlance. But uh, they, that was something they didn't, they, even while we were shooting, there was always that thing of, like, can we, you know, reduce the amount of fox and stuff like that, because that's what really offends people. Nina Jacobs had said to me, um, you know, you want to, you want to make it as, as, as mainstream as possible, and I was like, well, why? I, you know, I'm not into that. I like the idea of, like, you got a theater full of people and only four people are laughing at any particular joke because, like, they get it and the other guys don't. And she was like, yeah, but Kevin, like, isn't, isn't it better to have your film seen by as many people as possible? Reach a wide Reach high. the widest possible audience. You know, that way more people are laughing. Um, and she, you know, it, she made sense at the time. Yeah. Made a lot know, of sense. She definitely made sense, and I was like, "Yeah, I guess you're right. I guess it is important to reach the widest possible audience." She's like, "Well, right. tempering some of these things will do that," and that's we, we were interested in that. That was, I mean, the reason we, I mean, the reason we went to go make a movie at Universal was to make a studio film. I mean, that's the whole point, I guess. And we had decided to, you know, we thought, well, we'll make a commercial movie. We'll try out the studio, and then making this big, huge studio film, this blockbuster that'll make us millions of dollars, will finance the making of, of lots of, of smaller films. I mean, that was our idea at the time. It never felt like, oh, we're selling out. Um, it felt like, well, we're going to get to make a movie that's a little better looking than the last one and, and maybe get some people who are professional actors involved. My only problem with the studio was they told us at a certain point that the budget was going to be six million. And, and Jim and Sean said that too, six million, we want six million at least. And we were like, why? You know, so it's a little picture about kids running around the mall. Just let's not spend that much money on it in case it doesn't really pan out. And that was, I would still, and as I am to this day, very budget conscious. I hate to lose money for somebody. Um, and you just never knew what the audience was going to be, how, how big it would be, or if it would tank or whatnot. So we, we would argue against the six million. And they said, look, you can't make a movie for less than six million dollars. And we were like, but we did. We made a movie for like 27 grand. They were like, that's not a movie. So, um, you know. I Six get million was like no budget filmmaking. 
What's really important is the story you're telling and what the actors are doing, and and that that's what the audience is going to be involved in, not how much money you kind of throw at the screen. Yes, you know, Chasing Amy would have looked a lot more polished. Mallrats could have looked a lot more slick if they had, you know, dumped money in it. But ultimately, that's not what the stories. That's not the kind of movies trying to make. It's not what the stories are about. So I don't think it would have benefited from that. Uh, you know, from that kind of spending, as some movies do. You know, I don't think you could make The Rock, you know, on the cheap. But uh, but Chasing Amy is, uh, I think, just as good a movie at 250,000 as it would have been at, you know, 500 million or or Mallrats, for that example. Uh, in fact, if anything, uh, Mallrats should have been cheaper. <laughs> no, it was, it was kind of it was something we could have done for like a million or under, definitely. Although, you know, what do I know? <laughs> Picture didn't make a nickel. <laughs> What I really like about making flicks is um, is putting stuff up there that I identify with, stuff that I don't, never get to see on, on screen and stuff that I'm kind of into. The first time I read the script, you know, I, I thought it was just very thoughtful and funny and really kind of smart. Uh, it had a sort of a sharp wit that uh, uh, I thought was unusual for that kind of, you know, teen comedy movie. The execs dug the stuff that was coming in. Tom Pollock, who was the head of the studio at one point, called while we were in production and, and you know they're like Tom Pollock's on the phone for you and I was like oh heavens and um, you know Pollock used to be Spielberg's lawyer or something like that very famous man and been at Universal for a long time before he left and now heads up the or works at the the um, the AFI American Film Institute or, or is it, has a chair there or something good guy real good guy calls up and is just like hey man I've watched the footage of Stan Lee and Brody and let me tell you I haven't felt like this since I saw you know um, Wolfman Jack talking to Dick Dreyfus and uh, American, American Graffiti, graffiti. Um, and I was just like wow yeah, wow thanks and so all through production we were just like this I think this movie's gonna pan like, out you're gonna be the new George Lucas <laughs> yeah, I was like that's, that's next we're gonna do space operas we were we, we were feeling good about it studio was feeling good about it it was funny stuff the alleys were funny um, test screenings after we test had screenings closed. after we were done were, were good. Scores were great. The, the execs loved the movie. I'm Jay, and this is Sal and Bob, my head of life mate. Mm. Um, explain who we are, though. I explain how who you are and who the character is. Who are you? I'm Jay. Yes, but who are you? <laughs> I'm Jay the drug dealer. And but who are you in real Jay. life? I get your question. What's your name, dickhead? Oh, Jason Mewes. <laughs> well, I mean, who am I? I'm Jason Mewes. I'm Jay, I said. When I first met Mewes, Jason Mewes, I was scared of him. I was like, that's the guy from Clerks. And he was so raw and real in Clerks. I thought he was really that type guy. That would be like, fuck you, man. What are you looking at? I want to smoke you. I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> So, because he was like hitting on girls at the audition, like, "What's up? What hotel are you staying at?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> actresses and stuff. So I thought, man, this guy's one of those real guys that they put in the movie because he's really like that. Right? <laughs> so I kind of kept my distance, and he sort of picked up on that, and he was—he thought I was mean when he first met me. Like, you didn't even talk to me at the audition, man. You ignored me. I was like, I was scared of you. I thought you were gonna try to kick my ass. They didn't. They hated. Me. Muse. They didn't want Muse to play Muse. I was they didn't an want actor. It was scary. <laughs> scary, dirty. You can't understand him. You know, he looks like one of your friends that you just put in the movie. I was like, well, that's pretty much the whole movie that we did. Um, they were lobbying against it, and we got Muse to come out for the for the pizza party too. And other people up against Muse, they wanted Seth Green. Studio wanted Seth Green, who went on to be in Austin Powers. Um, Buffy. Buffy's on Buffy now. He was Austin Powers, uh, the Doctor Evil's son. Son, and Brecken Meyer, who was in, who went on to play a very Jay-like role in Clueless. They liked him too. And uh, you know, those guys are fine actors and whatnot. But it's and those guys ultimately were they didn't understand why Jay wasn't playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because everyone who came in were big fans of Clerks, so they were just like, why are why are you even auditioning anyone for Jay? Because yeah, Jay they, is they Jay. saw the, the illogic in the situation as well. The first day of shooting for me, the two producers were there watching. He's like, you know, you got to do good because these guys are watching. If they don't like you, they're going to cut you. So I just went all out. Muse came out and then just, you know, worked hard before he came out and did it justice. and. And we still had to argue, and they were like, all right, fine, we'll let you keep your muse. But what happens is 
we won't fly him out there to Minnesota where we were shooting. Um, we won't pay to have him put up in the hotel. You'll have to put him in your room. We won't pay him through the rehearsal process. And the first day of shooting, if we don't like his dailies, we're shit canning him, and then you're hiring one of the two people we like. I remember the first the first take, I was nervous, and I didn't do that good. And then he pulled me aside. He's like, dude, you're watching. He's like, you got to do it right now. He's like, just go off. So then I did it, and then I liked it, I th hope. We shuffled Muse's scenes to almost midway mm -hmm. into the shoot. We tried to push it as late into the shoot as possible so that they wouldn't shit can him. And, um, after his first day of dailies, the studio got back to us and loved him, and then people just fell in love with him as, as the movie went on, and, and, and then they built their marketing campaign on Snoochie Boochies and Jay and Silent Bob and whatnot, so they kind of fell, fell for Muse later on. I had seen Clerks, and so I knew about Jay and Silent Bob from that movie, and I, I thought they were hysterically funny in that movie, and, uh, and they kind of served to carry along all four of his movies now, and uh, I think it's just a dynamic that he's developed that works really well, and he keeps finding ways to make it kind of original and fresh, and to make them kind of augment the story he's telling, where in Chasing Amy, they just kind of showed up at one point, but it was kind of a critical point, and again, in Dogma, they, they sort of, they have a more Mallrats-esque kind of of um, undercurrent with the story the whole way, but it's just a, it's just this bizarre sort of uh, relationship with these two strange characters that Kevin kind of tapped into, and I think has been able to make work really successfully. And it's really fun to to just sort of get hang around those guys. <laughs> Working with Kevin Smith. Uh, the first experience, it was the first director I'd ever worked with, so I hadn't had any experiences of working with, you know, asshole directors that, you know, don't give the time of day to the actor. But with Kevin, it was more like working with a friend who's making a movie and you're in the movie because you're friends. That's the way it was, it seemed, at the even at the very beginning. You know, he would let me ask a thousand questions and not get annoyed by me, you know? He, w he was willing to work with me. And... I got his sense of humor and he got my sense of humor. So right off the bat, it was incredibly smooth and there was no problems after that. My favorite memory was just uh, learn about Mallrats, was learning uh, that, that you could have that kind of environment on a movie, that you could get along with people that you met in the business that well, that they could become friends of yours, and that uh, you could have that good a time, you know. Uh, the most lasting, enduring, um, thing from that movie for me is my friendship with Kevin, which I value very much. Working with Kevin is uh, great because knowing his personality, knowing your personality, um, you kind of know what you expect and your sense of humor and uh, real easygoing and uh, a lot of fun on every set we've been on so far. He's fun loving, funny. He's got a heart of gold, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I would never have played that part or done that were it not for Kevin, because I certainly wasn't being paid any money. Gramercy's getting ready with the movie, and Gramercy, God love them, good people. Russell Schwartz, great guy. All the people that work in there are great. Steve, who was in marketing, publicity, was a great guy. They just couldn't market the movie to save their lives, couldn't market themselves out of a paper bag. And it was so bad that they looked to us. That, and that was ideas. the that's that's when you know shit's in trouble. Like you want your filmmaker to approve things, but you don't want to go like, well, what would you do? Because they came to us with the poster. They had all these poster concepts. At one point, Peter Bag, who draws a comic book called Hate, was going to draw the poster. They approached him about doing it. They had these bad mock-ups, which uh, which you'll probably see on on the DVD somewhere um, of, of images for posters, and mm. it was all terrible, terrible stuff. And they were like, well, what would you do? And all we were thinking about was what was going to look good on our office wall, the kind of poster you want to keep and hang up. So we were like, well, we should do it like a comic book cover. And we designed this poster that looks like a comic book cover. And Drew Struzan was going to draw it. And, Drew know, Struzan and did draw it. He did. Drew, and he's a guy that drew a lot of Spielberg's posters, um, his Indiana Jones stuff, and the Hook one comes to mind. He's yeah. drawn a lot of posters. and. Did a really nice job on this. The likenesses were great, and it was a good-looking poster. But <clears throat> anyone who didn't know shit about the movie wasn't going to learn anything from looking at the poster. And you'd look at that poster, and you're going, "I don't recognize anybody on it. It's a big comic book. Is this a movie or a book? I don't know, and I'm not going." So that kind of happened. They had big bus stop ads. It was kind of great. We never had anything like that. And 
So there's this marketing campaign that just didn't really pan out, and they put TV spots on. The TV spots were kind of quick and weak, and then they were kept like. Well, it was always like you know Jason Lee and Shannon Doherty. So many hate and so many you don't know. Like go see the movie. I <laughs> Check mean, it just, out. Yeah. And um, but we had but by this point we'd had this historic screening in San Diego at the Comic Con. Now mind you, if you show Mallrats to a Comic Con audience, of course you're going to get a great reaction. There's a lot of comic book stuff in it. So Warner, uh, Warner Brothers Evans, Universal was very very excited by those results from that screening. They were like, they oh, we it to the Animal House test screening. Yes, yeah, the historic like... Animal House test screening. They were like, this is amazing. We're going to make a fortune. So and it, it went from like a movie that could make maybe 12 or 20 to a movie that could probably do 100. I remember Jim Jacks, God love him, was like, we can do that Pulp Fiction business. This is your Pulp Fiction, you know. I had no idea, um, when we were first on the set of Mallrats, uh, the, uh, the assistant, not the assistant, the second assistant director told us, you know, it's, it's great, like, once you get your initial paycheck, every time it goes on video or, or TV, you know, you'll get, you'll get a small amount of money. And, uh... We were like, yeah, you know, and when we see it, we'll believe it. We didn't think that, you know, somebody who, who just, you know, was playing a bit part would get that. But Mallrats has been really good to us. Uh, we just got another check the other day for the TV yeah, version. 50 40 bucks, Yeah, okay. $50. When it went on video, we got $80. Every time it appears on, like, you know, Stars or one of those small things, uh, you know, you get a check for 11 bucks. I mean, it's not paying the rent or anything, but, you know, it's like a free 11 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought... It would be the biggest comedy hit of all time. <laughs> and I didn't understand what it meant because I didn't know anything about numbers and all this. And I didn't understand what it meant that it didn't do well. I thought, well, it's not the movie because I thought, you know, the movie was genius. So there's something wrong with other people. You know, to, to, I, don't, I, I didn't quite understand it. But it didn't really bother me that much the numbers and, and how it did in the box office because I knew the experiences I had working on the movie and I knew what it meant to me and I knew that it was funny. So if they don't think it's funny and if they don't like it, fuck them, right? That movie's going to be around forever and we're all going to have our experiences with it. So all that other box office bullshit and what the critics say, that doesn't matter. Critics, schmittics, right? It's a, good, it's a good movie. But I was a little confused at first. But here we are now doing a, a special edition DVD that's probably going to sell a lot of copies because it's got a huge following. This has nothing to do with the box office. I've been trashed by critics before. Kenny Turan in the LA Times said, um, you know, if his opening paragraph was, if the um, if the AFI ever gives a, if the AFI or Sundance ever gives a course on what not to do as a second feature, Mallrat should be at the heart of its curriculum. And Kenny Turan had loved Clerk, so we felt like, wow, we really let Kenny Turan down. Um, and, and the reviews, aside from a few good ones and some of the people that really supported us on Clerks, were pretty fucking abysmal. They were pretty bad. So we're reading that and going like, well, you know what? The idea behind this movie was it was always going to be critic-proof because the audience for this movie doesn't read. So, you know, they're not going to read the reviews. Nobody's going to care. And that's what we get for second-guessing the audience. Um, we got back to Jersey that night, the night it opened. We went to our local theater, and we, you know, God, it's going to be a huge packed crowd. And it was a, it was sparsely dense. Yeah. It wasn't packed, but it was like the nine o'clock show on a Friday night. You'd imagine if it was ever going to be packed, it was going to be that night, and it wasn't. So Saturday morning, <clears throat> Jim Jacks calls with the with the grosses for Friday night, and so he's just like, we're like, well, what do we do? What do we do? And Jim goes, um, bring it up. Bring it on. Let's hear it. And Jim's like, well, we did four hundred thousand, and we were like, great. Which theater? <laughs> and um, and he's like, no, that's that's all of them. And we'd opened on six hundred and fifty screens, and we were like, really, four hundred thousand. Now, does a movie go up by like a thousand percent on a Saturday night, or, or what are we talking about here? And he's like, well, it's it's dead. It's dead. Like it, it's like it, it's over. It's done. We're that finished. That was it. And we're like, no, you know, it's just like you know, it's we like, started we small with clerks. Million. Of, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, Saturday? but clerks only started on like two screens. I was pissed, man. I thought I was gonna get an Oscar for it, you know, for best supporting actor, but it didn't pan out. So a lot of people tried to blame said, you. A lot of people said it was your fault. Nah. Not they put no. They blamed um, what's his name? It was Jim Jacks. You know that Jacks was your fault. He's making us cut out these curses and stuff. 
cum shots and things. <laughs> no, I don't know whose fault it was. I'm like him, but you know, I like the movie. I, th I don't think it was that much of a flop because everyone I know that sees it likes it. I guess it didn't make as much money as it could have, but I mean, I think it turned out to everyone. Everyone I talked to pretty much likes it. It was a film that definitely yeah. found its audience on video later mm -hmm. on. People got into it there.